Good evening, everybody. Hello. I'd like to welcome everyone to the East Tennessee History Center. My name is Dr. Warren Doctor, and I am the CEO and president of the East Tennessee Historical Society. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out uh, for this evening's events. We have a great uh, show lined up for you this evening, a symposium, I should probably call it. Um, and uh, I just want to invite everyone, if you're not already a member of the East Tennessee Historical Society, I'd like to go ahead and invite everyone here um, to become a member. This is, these are the kind of programs that we like to put on. And of course, we have a recent, oh, we have a recent exhibition um, that has just come out on the 1982 World's Fair. Uh, so come back and see it sometime. And a pro tip for you is, is it's free on Sundays. Um, so I, I want to go ahead and turn it over. I, I, I would like to introduce uh, the next, I'm, I'm not really a speaker, I'm just sort of saying hi. Uh, the speaker now, Dr. Um, Ernie Freeberg, who is the head of the UT History Department, and I'm going to hand, hand over to him. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody, thank you for coming uh, to a program that we call When the World Came to Knoxville, uh, Remembering the 1982 World's Fair. Uh, planning for this event began in that, that hazy time some years ago before the pandemic, not quite sure what year it was, but it was several years ago. Uh, and we started this because we were inspired by a wonderful program that, that uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sheldon Wu did in this uh, very room, uh, looking at the, the, the World's Fair's most popular exhibit uh, the China Pavilion, uh, and this was, as she taught us all, was a very important moment in U.S.-Sino relations, uh, and a story about the fair that was uh, quite new to me, having been in Knoxville uh, for the past 20 years. I knew, of course, about the sun sphere, it's hard to miss. I knew about the rise and the fall and the rise again of World's Fair Park. But Shellen's research made us realize that there were a lot of other interesting stories to tell about the fair and that the 40th anniversary would be a good time to tell them. So Shelley and I met with, with uh, Jack Neely from the Knoxville History Project and also with Steve Cottom, recently retired uh, from the Knox County Archives. Uh, he told us that there were huge piles of World's Fair material dumped in unorganized fashion uh, in the archives that had never really been sorted through. Uh, and, and part of what this project has been able to do is provide a little bit of resources uh, to, to help organize and digitize some of those materials. So as we were talking uh, there on World's Fair Park uh, at nine o'clock in the morning, there was, a, there was a man sitting next to us drinking a beer and uh, we didn't realize that he was listening to our conversation, but after, after we broke, we talked about all sorts of aspects of the fair. He tracked me down on the way back to campus and said, I got it, I heard you talking about the fair. I went to the fair every single day. My wife was a nurse and they got free passes. And so I went and at a certain point it got so boring that my friends and I had this plan that we would lock onto a visiting family and we would just follow the fair every day right behind them and just see the fair through their eyes. You know? So I found since in talking about the fair that lots of people have these sorts of quirky personal uh, stories. But we decided we would be looking for uh, those stories that would be enriched from a humanities perspective. And this project, we're very pleased, has been funded by, uh, in part by a grant from Humanities Tennessee. Melissa Davis got us started. She's in, in the back here, founder of The Feast. Thank you for coming. From my perspective as a university professor, uh, one of the great pleasures of this project has been the way that it's helped us to build uh, on an ongoing partnership between our history department and these vibrant community organizations that share the same goal of preserving and sharing the past. And that includes, uh, we'll hear from tonight, the Knoxville History Project, uh, the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound, of course, the East Tennessee Historical Society, and WUOT. Tonight, we'll see some newly uncovered video uh, from the fair brought to us by Eric Dawson, uh, who was uh, head of the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound. Uh, Jack Neely and Paul James uh, from the Knoxville History Project will share uh, the background story of the, the, the book that uh, I believe many of you have at this point that was put together uh, by this project. I will also talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that we've done in putting together a, a four-part podcast series uh, with the help of Todd Steed and WUOT that will start airing on May 20th uh, once a week talking through some of the background of this. 
uh, this, these projects. And we were fortunate in planning that series uh, to know about Dr. Michael Camp, uh, who's our first speaker tonight. Uh, he's the featured guest on our first podcast. He was, I'm proud to say, a, a graduate of UT's history department with honors. He went on to get an MA in social science from the University of Chicago, where he wrote a thesis about the Knoxville World's Fair. And then he went on to uh, get his PhD from Emory University in history and ended up writing a book out of his dissertation called Unnatural Resources, Energy and Environmental Politics in Appalachia after the 1973 oil embargo, which was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2019. When I wrote to Mike and asked him what he would like to title his, his uh, talk today, he said, Knoxville meets the world planning the International Energy Exposition 1933 to 1982. And I immediately wrote back and said, there must be a typo here. You mean 1973, right? And he said, no, 1933. That will make the crowd interesting. So here we go. Michael, thank you very much for being here. Hi, everybody. So uh, thank you to the Department of History at the University of Tennessee, the East Tennessee Historical Society, and all the other sponsors of tonight's event uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, so the question animating tonight's proceedings is, was the World's Fair of 82 uh, in Knoxville historic? Uh, whenever pr I'm presented with a question like this, I fall back on some advice I got when studying for my doctoral qualifying exams, that if I didn't have a crisp answer uh, ready for a question, the advice was just to uh, say that there were a lot of different ways of looking at the question and then just kind of start talking about everything that you know about the subject. And certainly Professor Freeberg knows this advice. Um, so obviously uh, there are a lot of different ways to look at the subject even after having uh, time to think about it. The first thing to note is that if you go uh, online and look at the list of American cities that held World's Fairs in the 20th century, you see cities like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Dallas, and Knoxville. So I think, you know, first and foremost, to get Knoxville on a list like that is quite an achievement, quite a historic thing for the city. The second thing is that uh, some of tonight's speakers will uh, think about some specifically historic aspects of the fair itself, but I wanted to use my time to think about uh, how the World's Fair fits not just into the history of Knoxville, but into longer historical trajectories of 20th century American political history. Uh, as Professor Freeberg pointed out, uh, the title of the talk, uh, Knoxville Meets the World, Planning the International Energy Exposition, 1933 to 1982. Indeed, he had some quizzical questions for me when I had 1933 in the title. And I would argue that the fair uh, exists in longer trajectories of political history not just as a, a response to the American energy challenges of the 1970s, which it certainly was, but in a much longer uh, story about uh, American politics and American society in the 20th century. Because 1933 was the year that brought a new administration to Washington, D.C., the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who immediately had to set, uh, set himself to work of uh, getting the nation out of the Great Depression that was causing so many problems. If you've ever uh, studied the Great Depression, you've probably seen the alphabet soup of New Deal agencies that Roosevelt created in response, the WPA, the PWA, the CCC, the FDIC, uh, all these alphabet soups of agencies to get uh, unemployed Americans back to work, to revitalize the banking system, to prevent the runs on banks that you've probably seen in movies like It's a Wonderful Life uh, and other things like that. We're all probably familiar with the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, created to electrify the South and lift the rural South out of poverty. One of Roosevelt's advisors, Rexford Tugwell, said that the South was an albatross around the nation's neck. Its poverty was keeping the nation as a whole down. And so the TVA was designed to bring it out uh, of that poverty that was keeping the Great Depression going. But I would argue that the most important federal agency created during the New Deal in 1934 the most important agency for understanding uh, American politics in the 20th century was the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA created in 1934. What Roosevelt recognized with the, was that one of the root causes of the Great Depression was that uh, in the roaring 20s, uh, the uh, kind of false prosperity of the 1920s, 
one of the key problems that emerged was over construction of businesses, over construction of factories, over construction of homes. In this economic fervor of the 1920s, there was just too much being built at one time for the nation to really absorb all the construction going on. If you remember the financial crisis and housing bubble of 2008, you have some idea of what was going on with fervor and speculation reaching a fever pitch and then plunging the nation into depression once it was realized that there was simply too much overheating going into the economy. So what Roosevelt decided to do is create a federal agency uh, guaranteeing mortgages for banks that if somebody, if a lender defaulted on a mortgage uh, or a, a, yeah, a, lend, a lendee defaulted on a mortgage for a, a single family home, the government would provide subsidies uh, to that lender, that bank giving out a mortgage, to decrease the risk of giving out mortgages to people wanting to buy homes. The effect of creating federal subsidies for uh, people to buy homes was that the average down payment required to buy a home went from 50% prior to 1934 down to 20% after 1934. If you can imagine, those of you who own a home, if you had to have 50% of the uh, purchase price in cash in hand to buy it, it was quite a steep hill to climb, and decreasing that to 20% allowed a lot of Americans to buy single-family homes. So what happened, uh, what began to happen in the 1930s is the creation of modern suburbia, uh, suburbs like Inman Park in Atlanta, uh, one of the nation's first streetcar suburbs, and around the country, around uh, major and minor cities, single-family homes began to crop up, people were put to work building them, uh, helped get the nation out of the Depression. Another thing that happened after the end of World War II was the passage of the GI Bill, allowing millions of returning American servicemen uh, to go to college, to get a good education, to become engineers and advertisers, uh, marketers, uh, financial analysts, all, kind of, all kinds of uh, learned occupations that allowed people to earn a comfortable middle class income with this new education they uh, received in return for fighting in the war. The third thing that happened in 1956, Dwight D. Eisenhower's creation uh, of the federal highway uh, system, allowing Americans to go to and from downtown city centers very quickly as opposed to uh, having to use rural roads. Uh, my father, who grew up in the 1950s in Atlanta, talks about having to go uh, from Norcross, where he grew up, uh, northeast of Atlanta, down to school at Georgia Tech before the creation of I-85 and a trip that was uh, an hour when he was in college in the mid-1960s is now about 10 or 15 minutes because of the creation uh, of I-85 in Atlanta, made uh, building outside of city centers even more feasible than it had been before. So what happened after uh, mass suburbanization, after Americans began uh, to move outside of city centers, is the downtowns began to have kind of a hard time getting by. Property taxes that are collected on homes outside of city limits don't do a whole lot uh, for city budgets. Sales taxes collected when people are shopping outside of city limits also don't do a whole lot for downtown uh, city center budgets. And so city leaders across the country and in Knoxville began to panic about what was going to happen to downtown as the money that had been flowing in began to trickle and dry up as Knoxvillians began to buy homes further and further outside of city limits. One of the ideas they came up with in the mid-1950s was to create a combined city-county government with Knox County and the city of Knoxville sharing a combined government that would allow it to pull its resources and direct them uh, to appropriate places and keep the downtown sector uh, of the city of Knoxville funded. As you can imagine, in the McCarthyite fervor of the 1950s, anything, any plan that seemed to expand the reach of government and combine governments together uh, was ripe for accusations of communism, uh, and that plan quickly fell by the wayside as uh, Knoxvilleians protested and killed the measure. And so Knoxville leaders were kind of at a loss for what to do next. There didn't seem to be a solution as uh, property taxes and sales taxes and uh, business and commerce more uh, generally moved outside of the downtown city center out, out to uh, outlying cities and suburbs. This was especially uh, made difficult in 1972 with the opening of West Town Mall, which took a lot of business away from the downtown city uh, and moved it out to West Hills uh, with merchants and business people and other uh, business elites in downtown uh, fearing for uh, their future, live, future livelihoods in a very real way. So business leaders, uh, political leaders, the mayor's office, the city council, 
were desperate for something uh, they could do to galvanize redevelopment in downtown and restore its financial health after uh, three decades plus of rampant suburbanization, taking money away from downtown. And they found it, uh, potentially, with the World's Fair of 1974, which has just happened in Spokane, Washington, and uh, galvanized that downtown and galvanized that city and seemed to serve as a template uh, for Knoxville's redevelopment. Knoxville leaders uh, knew that in order to attract the attention of the World's Fair, the US government, all the entities that would have to make something like this possible, they needed uh, some kind of key theme that would uh, get the White House's attention and Congress's attention uh, and bring federal dollars into downtown to help redevelop it. And uh, luckily for Knoxvillians, uh, those planning the fair, they found that with the oil crisis of 1973 and 1974, which made energy a massively pressing public policy issue uh, for uh, the American nation to encounter and confront. So the short version of what happened is that uh, in 1973, the nation of Israel was at war with Egypt over the Sinai Peninsula, that little strip of Egypt in the Northeast. Uh, and the US was covertly supporting Israel in that war with Egypt for control of that peninsula. Uh, due to some uh, weather delays and uh, planes uh, not taking off on time, the US eventually got caught supporting Israel. Uh, the nations uh, allied with Egypt were not very happy about it. And so Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and other oil producing nations got instituted swift cutbacks in oil exports uh, as punishment for the US's involvement in this war between Israel and Egypt. The, uh, the result, as many of you will remember, were lines at gasoline stations, rationing, fist fights, um, people waiting literally for hours to fill up their tanks just to get around and take their kids to school and get to work and get to the grocery store and do the things required for daily life. And this was a massive shock for the country that after World War II had enjoyed uh, growing prosperity, a, per a perpetually rising increase in the standard of living. All of a sudden, it seemed like uh, that foundation was now not as reliable as it had been. It was the decade that historian Judith Stein calls the pivotal decade when American attitudes and the American financial industry changed as a response to external geopolitical pressures. But for Knoxville, uh, which has a lot of uh, involvement with the Tennessee Valley Authority, which has the Oak Ridge National Laboratory with a lot of experimental cutting edge energy research, which is very close to coal seams in Tennessee and Kentucky. Energy was suddenly a major concern for Americans and Knoxville found the theme that would bring the world to the city and bring a lot of tourist dollars and a lot of federal funding and a lot of money into the city to solve all these problems that had been festering for 30 plus years. The, uh, the original pitch was uh, to Richard Nixon, uh, who had an idea uh, called Project Independence uh, to uh, get the nation on a firm energy footing after the oil crisis. He was distracted by some emerging news about a break-in at the Watergate Hotel uh, that made focusing on anything else uh, fairly difficult. Uh, Knoxville then pitched to uh, Gerald Ford's Department of Commerce after Nixon's resignation. Ford was consumed with inflation and his controversial pardon of Nixon, uh, and again was not primed to do a whole lot. But the election of 1976 and the beginning of 1977 brought a new administration to the White House that was very focused on energy uh, as a public policy issue and very primed to do something major about it. Jimmy Carter, who uh, assumed the presidency in 1977, the peanut farmer and nuclear engineer from Georgia, I still haven't figured out how those two quite go together, uh, but they did, was very concerned about what the oil crisis meant uh, for Americans' futures going forward. Carter was a strict Southern Baptist and was worried not just about the, you know, the pragmatic ins and outs of energy policy, but had thought that Americans uh, this, that the oil crisis of 1973 and 1974 had proved that Americans had lost some of their moral footing and had lost a, uh, their aptitude for a shared sense of purpose uniting the nation in a common struggle. For Carter, this was the country that had achieved independence from the British Empire, had fought a brutal civil war to uh, pass the 13th Amendment and end slavery, uh, had defeated fascism during World War II, and now it seemed like Americans were more interested in complaining about not being able to uh, 
you know, do go out to the movies as much as they might want because they didn't have enough gas to get there, then they were about coming together and sacrificing and doing something about this major pressing issue. Carter uh, was the one who created a cabinet level Department of Energy uh, to uh, standardize and center the nation's energy policies uh, and was primed to uh, uh, favorably look upon a pitch from Knoxville to have an event focused on energy to focus the nation and the world on this uh, major issue moving forward. Carter uh, was a pragmatist in some respects though. He knew uh, that the nation would not uh, change its uh, consumer habits overnight. And so in addition to having tax credits for home insulation and other measures for conservation to, the, to get Americans in the long term to use less energy and to be less wasteful, he was interested in the short term while this uh, transition in frame of mind was taking place to increase domestic production of coal, domestic production of natural gas, potentially nuclear power, hydroelectricity, and other potential alternatives for the imported oil that was not uh, suddenly so reliable as it had been. Before 1973 and 1974, a lot of uh, power plants burned oil instead of coal and switched to coal after 1973 and 1974 because coal was abundant uh, and relatively easy to get in the US. So Carter was very interested, assigned his Commerce Secretary Juanita Kreps to work with uh, these people showing up from Knoxville to plan an international exposition. And Tennessee senators uh, and representatives were able to secure funding for the fair in Congress and begin to make it a reality. So planning uh, went smoothly through 1977, 78, 79. Uh, and you can see in the exhibit that the historical societies put together all the changes that began to take shape in Knoxville as planning uh, for the 82 World's Fair approached. What happened uh, in 1978 and 1979, though, changed Carter's political fortunes and again changed the nation's uh, attitudes toward energy. Carter had uh, famously lectured the nation from the White House uh, in wearing a cardigan uh, to encourage Americans to turn down their thermostats uh, and increase uh, what they were wearing to use less energy, had lectured the nation on being too wasteful, had lectured the nation on being irresponsible, and kind of made this deal with the American public that if you rethink your standard of living, if you make these sacrifices, if you drive less, if you insulate your homes, if you wear your sweaters, then eventually we'll be able to have a more secure economic uh, future as a result of Im immediate sacrifices made now. In 1978, however, uh, some uh, Islamic fundamentalists in the nation of Iran took uh, control of that country's government, uh, exiled the ruling Shah, who was an ally of the United States, took hostages of American diplomats and other employees at the embassy in Tehran, and declared uh, a new opposition of Iran uh, to the United States and its influence, its historical influence in the region. The effect of this uh, global upheaval was a return to energy uncertainty with the Strait of Hormuz being uh, controlled by Iran, a major uh, uh, alleyway for oil shipments to other parts of the world. And so what happened is that the lines and ga uh, gasoline stations, the uncertainty, the uh, price hikes, the rationing made a return. And so uh, for Americans who were very busy in their daily lives, who had a lot going on, who were ne weren't necessarily thinking deeply about the connection between events half a world away with the religious revolution in Iran uh, and their oil supplies, saw this as uh, proof that Carter had been wrong about uh, America's energy future, that they had sacrificed, that they had done all the things he had asked, and yet still, only a few short late years later, we're back to the same problems we had uh, half a decade ago in 1973. So even though most of the planning for the fair took place under Carter, the creator of the Federal Energy Department, a strong proponent of uh, government intervention into energy, the fair itself took place during the administration of Ronald Reagan, who had a completely different orientation to what should be done about energy markets and what should be done economically more generally. Carter was a, a, deregula a deregulator, a proponent of private sector innovation, and so in stark contrast to Carter, he wanted to open up uh, the energy sector, remove all these price controls, remove all these government programs, remove all this rationing, remove all this muck that Carter had created, 
and allow oil companies and other energy producers to unleash their private sector uh, ingenuity. It uh, pursues some new technologies to drill in new places and uh, rescue the nation uh, from its energy challenges, not with uh, the expertise of government, but with the innovation and genius of the private sector. And so uh, even though Carter had planned the fair, it was Reagan who opened the fair, uh, used his opening remarks to uh, preach the value of deregulation, of allowing the private sector to uh, creatively solve the nation's energy challenges. And it's kind of fun to read press coverage at the time because Carter attended the fair and his vice president, Walter Mondale, attended the fair, but they're presented a kind of skulking around in the shadows and trying not to make too much of an impression while Reagan took the spotlight to uh, preach his uh, energy message. The ironic thing is that Reagan actually benefited from a lot of the conservation measures put into place by Carter in years before. The, 19, the 1980s actually saw a global decline in oil prices uh, as oil became more affordable in the global market, a product not just of uh, Carter's initiatives, Carter's conservation initiatives, but also Gerald Ford's passage in 1975 of fuel economy standards for American automobiles, uh, mandating that American auto producers over the following years uh, increase the fuel efficiency of their cars, passed in 1975, which by the 1980s was beginning to bear fruit as Ford and General Motors and Chrysler began to produce more fuel efficient vehicles they could go further uh, on a tank of gas. So Reagan uh, opened the fair, preached his energy message, and it brought uh, a lot of good federal funding and a lot of tourism to downtown and revitalized uh, a lot of uh, the ailing businesses that had been suffering up to that point. So the question, uh, was the fair historic? I think it certainly was so. It brought the world's attention to Knoxville. Uh, it's not often that the New York Times and Chicago Tribune are writing articles about what's going on in uh, the city of Knoxville. It got national attention. It changed the city uh, in the long term with the expansion of interstate highways, uh, which were me meant to facilitate tourist travel opening up uh, space for other further out suburbs, changing uh, the topography of the city, uh, and change the character of downtown with World's Fair Park and other uh, areas providing a nice place for university students to go and uh, uh, spend some time uh, during the day. I have some good uh, memories in college of playing some ultimate frisbee on World's Fair Park made possible by uh, the 82 World's Fair. So I think the question of was the fair historic, uh, it certainly was. Uh, and some other speakers tonight will uh, address other aspects of what was historic about it. So I think we have uh, time for a couple of questions. It seems that the, the development of the interstate system works against the development of the downtown and the, and, and the fuel efficiency standards, all of these things are actually working to, to make it more possible to live further away. Maybe that's a statement rather than a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, in the short term, uh, downtown was revitalized um, as all this money flowed in. As often happens uh, with events such as World's Fairs, similar events such as Olympics, which bring a lot of money and a lot of tourists into cities, but then uh, cause problems once those attentions and funds are withdrawn. Um, Knoxville, again, like any city, had uh, challenges in the ensuing decades. I remember when I was in college in the mid-2000s, uh, downtown was, again, kind of an area that there wasn't much going on. There was Market Square, but there were a lot of empty storefronts on Gay Street, uh, and some new efforts uh, around 2008 and the years after to uh, open the new Regal Theater and open some new uh, bars and restaurants have again revitalized downtown, but the story of any American city in the you know, post-1950, 20th century is a continual struggle of uh, coming up with solutions and then encountering more problems and coming up with solutions and this continual interplay between cities and suburbs. Any um, lessons learned from this history that might be useful for future planning and uh, for, for current uh, I think generally it's a good idea to get um, a lot of different socioeconomic groups and a lot of interest groups on board and have them uh, have a say in the planning. 
one of the controversial things that happened that's featured in the exhibit is the removal of a lot of low-income Knoxvillians from the World's Fair site as um, you know, their apartments were demolished or re, uh, redone into hotels for short-term tourist visits. And so making this happen in Atlanta with the Olympics and similar uh, events. And so having some, uh, some broad and a wide uh, array of voices to make sure that uh, plans are equitable and sustainable, I think, would go a long way in making these events a lasting success. Eyesores hanging out from the old building of hotels and places for people to stay that are now defunct. Mm -hmm. But the lofts in Knoxville just amaze me now. How many people I know want to live downtown or at least near the university uh, on the other side of the river? It's really amazing. I'm, I'm in awe. <laughs> yeah, I think part of that is the university increasing. Um, when I was in college, there were about 20,000 20, students, undergrad and grad, I think now there's about 27,000 or 28,000. That requires a lot more apartments and a lot more lots to be built to uh, house all the new employees that have to serve the students as long as the students themselves. So that's certainly a major part of downtown's current trajectory. And retirees. Retirees also. Um, I was wondering, just going back to the theme of energy for the fire, how much do you think the sort of knowledge exchange that happened in the symposium around energy actually helped propel sort of alternative energies after the fair? It's a little bit questionable. Um, we talked about this on our podcast episode, but there were a lot during the fair, there were a lot of uh, seminars, symposia. I think Albert Gore Sr. was in attendance talking about his experiences, a, a lot of experts in energy. And when you go hunting in archives for records of what was said in all of these dialogues going on, you can't find very much. You hear about the giant Rubik's Cube, and you hear about uh, these kind of kitschy, touristy attractions. But it seemed like there were almost two different events going on, where there were serious policymakers having serious discussions, and then a lot of people kind of having fun. Uh, I'm hopeful that at some point, uh, the records of all these dialogues and seminars and symposia might find their way out of people's attics and basements into archives so we can kind of analyze what was going on. Uh, but I haven't found a lot of evidence yet that this created a lot of real substantive change in the energy field. Maybe time for one more? Yes? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, a lot of the historical accounts of the World's Fair stress that uh, it was the first time the <coughs> People's Republic of China had uh, exhibited the World's Fair. And I, I wonder, is that overblown to you, that leaving sort of a legacy? And, uh, also, who was responsible for that initiative? Did that extend back to Nixon, or was that something else? I think I'll leave that for one of our other speakers tonight, who I think is going to talk on that very subject and should give you a good, robust response. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Eric Dawson. I'm the manager of the Calvin M. McClung Historical Collection upstairs on the third floor. Uh, give us a visit if you haven't. Uh, but as, as Ernie mentioned, when this project began several years ago, uh, I don't remember either, but um, Steve Cottom was uh, the manager of McClung then. And I was head of the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound, which, of course, is part of McClung. It's the AV wing um, that you know is still there. and and doing well under uh, John Morton and uh, Janine Winfrey, who's a, a new employee there. But so they, uh, Ernie and, and others approached me about uh, looking into the archives to find some audiovisual material, see what sort of film, video, audio we might have related to the fair. And amongst all that, those uh, number of boxes that were dropped off here and sort of not processed, it was quite a bit of video. Um, now we do have a lot of home movies, um, some local television, PBS, and even national television stories on the fair. But the sort of bulk of the collection, the sort of uh, you know overall view, just dozens of boxes came from an advertising firm called Ogilvy and Mather from New York, who were hired to sort of document the process of the fair. And you know any coverage that would happen, they would record it off of television and uh, any sort of uh, spots that were done. And so we relied on this quite a bit and went into it. And uh, I'm going to show, we're going to show some clips tonight 
uh, from Tamas. And the first one is actually a corporate update, uh, which these were produced periodically by Ogilvy and Mather for the stakeholders and to sort of sell the fair and try to give it, uh, you know, anybody potentially interested in investing or participating the best possible, you know, sheen on, on what was going to happen. And they, these archives are interesting because it really is, it's created to the, the fair's view of itself or the KIEE committee, like what they want to project out into the world. And so these corporate updates are pretty much that. They're also interesting because it shows the fair in various stages of development. And this, uh, I think it's about seven minutes, five to seven minutes, this segment that opens will do that as well. It shows sort of construction happening and uh, you've got Bo Roberts sort of like uh, walking the side and, and narrating as it goes. Um, contrast that, the clip following is a, uh, a national news piece that sort of gives another view. Um, you know, we, we've talked about how people outside of Knoxville and maybe uh, uh, across the country viewed it and with some skepticism and what that view was. And I'll leave it as a surprise as to what the, who's doing the talking, what the piece is, but it gives sort of a, another view that is, is not quite as, as rosy. And then uh, as, as far as the topic tonight of was the, uh, the fair historic, um, I, I think one of the more interesting aspects of the fair that doesn't get talked about quite a bit is the Folk Life Festival. Um, it, was, it was a really fascinating uh, series of events that went on through the course of the fair. The big thing, and what's probably talked about most, is the music because there were just some amazing performers and performances for uh, several months there. I see people nodding, so you all probably remember how special it was. Uh, there were fascinating, there were like 60 films shown, all with sort of a folk theme uh, that were also really interesting. There was a cooking component, there were crafts, um, just a really, something I hope we can go more uh, in depth in, in in any sort of future celebrations. But, but a clip I wanted, I chose here, is from a Folklife Festival that has a very specific local um, connotation. It's the Knoxville Radio Reunion. So people who played back on Kaz Walker's show, back on WNOX in the 30s, 40s, 50s, had this reunion. And it was quite a big deal uh, at the time because a lot of these people hadn't seen each other played together in quite a while. So I wanted to include that. And then finally, rounding out the clips, the whole piece is, is maybe around 17 minutes, is an excerpt from a film called World of Wonders that was narrated and hosted by John Cullen. Has anybody seen this film or even heard of it? You saw it? You remember when it played across the street? Um, I mean, they showed it Sunday. Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay, so did you see it back in 82? Yeah. Okay, yeah, Tim Burns, uh, of course, the Tennessee Theater, is the only person I've spoken to who seems to remember this, and he would remember it because he worked at the Tennessee, and they showed it uh, daily for about two weeks, every hour on the hour from 8.30 a.m. to, uh, what was it, 2.30 p.m., uh, at which case, and, and then they had to uh, set up for a play that night that John Cullum was directing uh, and starring in, the, um, the Dr Buster Drumright play. So since he was in town, uh, they basically tapped him to be the host, producer, and I, I'll admit I've never noticed what a wonderful voice he has until sort of watching this film. Uh, it's a history of world fairs, um, purportedly the first such film ever made, made by a local uh, filmmaker named Kennedy Maxwell, who worked for Lavage and Associates. I'm sure a lot of you remember him if you've uh, been around. He had his hands in a lot of things, but he produced this film, The History of World's Fairs. Colin makes an appearance. Uh, there's footage from opening day and footage of Colin walking the fair, so I've included that at the end just to kind of... Um, give another perspective. It's the only film I know of where there must be others, but um, it was shot on 35 millimeter. So that's kind of a unique thing. Everything else is like news footage on 16 millimeter. And it seems to be forgotten, uh, understandably in a way, because it was so specific to, to the fair. I have not seen a catalog record of it anywhere. We happen to get a print that is really faded magenta. Um, we color corrected it somewhat, or actually I should say AV Geeks over in uh, North Carolina, color corrected it, and did the transfer um, thanks to funding from TNT Signs and uh, TAMIS itself. Uh, we, we sent that out. But anyway, I hope you enjoy these clips. And now, update nine. The 1982 World's Fair, a spectacle never to be forgotten. 
ready for the May 1 Drag the Ring. 23 nations will be there, including the World's Fair First, the People's Republic of China, and just announced, the movie, entertainment, Bob Hope, the Kabuki Theater, Rudolph Jordan, Loretta Land will be there. The great corporations of the world will be there. Along with 11 billion people, let's take a closer look with President Bo Roberts. The advance numbers look great. Over 1 million tickets pre-sold, plus 110,000 season passes. Greyhound Lines, the industry leader, projects to charter over 5,000 motor coaches. We'll reach the 11 million attendance. Also, World's Fair Advertising has created a tremendous public appetite. The computerized accommodation system handles over 3,000 phone reservations each day. Okay, it was put in the computer on the 23rd of February, so you should receive While an additional 8,000 mail inquiries pour in. Rooms are still available. The slogan is for real, you've got to be there. Now let's take a look around the site. The World's Fair site is more than a mile long. Near the North Gate is the Stroh House. How you doing, John? I'm here in front of one of the stages in the more than three acres of the Stokely Van Camp Folk Life Festival. We'll have the sights, sounds, smells, and tastes of Southern Appalachia throughout this region. The Alderman Railway Station features two major restaurants with both indoor and patio dining. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. And just behind me, the Lifestyle and Technology Building and the Sun Sphere. And of course, there are pavilions representing 22 nations, including the newest participants, Panama, the Philippines, and Egypt. And of course, our own United States participating with the massive six-story open atrium structure. Hi. Hey. Well, the song, good to see you. Japanese Pavilion is one of the largest on the site. And I'm here inspecting it. I just saw your robots inside. It's really looking fantastic. And I think it will be one of the greatest ones on the uh, on the fair site. And we're looking forward to the opening on May 1st. And I appreciate the good work you're doing with your fellow workers here. And we look forward to being with you in just a few days. Thank you much. Thank you. Good to see you. In addition to the LNM station, over 50 restaurants will please any palate. Many nations will serve their own favorite delicacies, Peking duck, Hungarian goulash, Korean barbecue, Mexican chili relleno, just a part of the delicious menu. Hey guys, how's it going? Pretty good. All right, let's keep it going. <laughs> Entertainment will also play a major role in the World's Fair. With exotic international performers like the Zabili Dancers of Yugoslavia, they'll be performing at the Elm Tree Theater. All the way to the Tennessee Music and Dance Review at the State Amphitheater, the gigantic concert events in Nayland Stadium. It'll be a show like you've never seen before. The London Symphony, Bob Hope, Ain't Misbehaving, NFL Football, Loretta Lynn, Rudolph Nuria, Al Hurt, the Scottish National Orchestra, Johnny Cash, Red Skelton, Tim Weisberger, the Royal Tahitian Dance Company, Carlos Montoya, Mary Travers, Jimmy Walker, Lynn Anderson, the Warsaw Philharmonic, Dave Lockett, the Korean Folk Dancers, the Grand Kabuki Theater, and many more. The range will fill the site. The Clyde Stables, 350 marching bands, and the DuPont Music Makers. A team of corporate, government, and private leaders have made this World's Fair happen. They will be there. Energy problems and potentials will be examined and proposed at a time when energy needs preoccupy the world. Talent and creativity will be tested. Nations will put forward their best ideas. People in Tennessee, across America, and around the world are already working very hard to make the Energy Expo in Knoxville a success. I have given them my full support and I hope you will as well. Knoxville is really uh, in the heart of America's energy industry. This major international event has raised eyebrows around the globe. The Saturday Evening Post says putting on a World's Fair may have become too overwhelming an undertaking for London, New York, and Paris, but not so for Knoxville, Tennessee. Purdy Magazine says the fair already has been a success. Everything set for 11 million visitors. The Wall Street Journal reports the Chinese are in at the 1982 World's Fair. Better Homes and Gardens says World's Fair 82 may not be the biggest World's Fair ever, but it promises to be among the best. 
The world is coming to Knoxville for May 1. I'm standing at one of the vantage points for shows like Good Morning America, The Today Show, Cable News Network, plus hundreds of other media representatives will be here. Royalty, government officials, and celebrities from around the world will be here. Join them and us at the 1982 World's Fair. You've got to be there. The other guys on 60 Minutes are always going good places to investigate something. In the winter, they investigate things in Arizona and Florida. They never investigate anything in North Dakota in the winter, I notice. In the summer, they go to Europe to investigate something. I never get to go anywhere, and I'm tired of it. So this week, I went to Knoxville, Tennessee to look at the World's Fair. I'm not sure how to show you what I saw. I've been so few places, I'm not very experienced doing what the correspondents call a stand-upper. If the story's about the White House, they stand up in front of the White House. As we saw CBS News, the White House. Bob, the Supreme Court correspondent, stands up in front of the Supreme Court. Graham, CBS News at the Supreme Court. If the story's about Congress, they stand up in front of the Capitol. Bruce Warren, CBS News, Capitol Hill. The correspondents are all good at it, but I had an awful time trying to do a stand-upper in Knoxville. This is Andy Rooney at the World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm standing in front of the magnificent United States exhibition here. A huge, pardon me, fella. Uh, sir, would you, would you mind, please, sir? This is Andy Rooney at the World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, Mike probably has his own hairdresser come with him on eagles. <laughs> this is Andy Rooney at the World's Fair in Knoxville. Time. Take your time. Probably has a wardrobe lady, too, to strip his tie for him. This is Andy Rooney in Knoxville, Tennessee at the World's Fair. I'm standing in front of the Canadian exhibition here. Time. Straight the sign. Yesterday, President Reagan opened this fair in front of a huge crowd of people. This is Andy Rooney at the World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm standing in the moment in front of the Australian exhibition. Behind me is the Sun Sphere, the theme of this great World's Fair in Nashville, Tennessee. In uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. It turns out that Knoxville didn't like being confused with Nashville all the time, so they decided to have a World's Fair. You know what World's Fairs look like. They always have a lot of funny shaped, very modern looking buildings. But a World's Fair always says, this is how the world's going to be in the future. Although the future never looks anything like this. There are two official categories of World's Fairs, big ones and little ones. The fair in Knoxville is a little one, but if you like big crowds in small places, you'll like this one. Everyone in Knoxville is scared about their fair for two reasons. First, they're afraid no one will come, and second, they're afraid everyone will come. There have been, I guess, six or eight World's Fairs in my lifetime. I've been to three of them. I think the biggest reason to go to a World's Fair is, if you don't, all the rest of your life, People are saying to you, hey, was you to the World's Fair in Knoxville? Some of the doings out here as we bring you Radio Reunion Night 
And you know you heard that little band right there that started off. They have chosen to call themselves a house band. It's really Red Record and all his bunch. And Red has backed up such headliners as Charlie Monroe, Carl Story, Reno and Smiley, just name them. Hilo Brown, Dolly Parton, he has backed them all up. And of course his, 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 his field is old time bluegrass and country music and he's one of our great citizens of Knoxville, Tennessee. Here's Red and they call it the house band. Hey, hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grant. It's always a great uh, pleasure to see you and have the opportunity to work with you. And uh, tonight we have one of my favorite fiddlers and favorite fiddler of everybody, Jerry Moore, who's going to get things underway with an old-time toe-tapping tune titled Bill Cheatham. Okay, Jerry. <laughs>
World's Fair is an amazing entity like nothing else on earth. It influences art and architecture and creates new tastes and living habits. It is an arena for the display of mankind's great achievements and a place for nations to meet in an atmosphere of goodwill and friendship. It is a shared experience for millions of people, inspiring, exciting, fun-filled, wonderful. celebration full of pomp and pageantry, dazzle and glitter. Its goals are good. To share ideas, to promote peace, harmony, and progress. In a world where we hear so much that is negative and pessimistic, the World's Fair, with its focus on the future, is positive and optimistic, full of hope and promise. It's an adventure, a visit to distant lands, a journey into the future, an escape from the everyday world to a world of wonder. And you are an important part of it all. What is the people who come, bringing their energy and enthusiasm, who make the World's Fair. Come along. Jack Neely, uh, I uh, am executive director of the Docile History Project, and we invite you to to join uh, our many our many programs. We've done several programs about the World's Fair just this year, uh, but uh, I uh, have a, a bit of personal history. I usually know things because I've studied them in the library, but this is a this is a, a, a subject I know pretty intimately because I, I began as a neighbor of the World's Fair. I lived in Fort Sanders about a block and a half away from the, uh, from the west gate of the fair uh, from 1979 to 1985. So I saw the, the, the building of it, I saw the fair itself, and I saw the aftermath. Um, uh, but also, I, uh, I, I think I thank the uh, recession of, eight, eight, I, I graduated from college in 81, and I thank the recession of 81 for the fact that I had to get find work at the World's Fair. I was hoping to get a salary job uh, with a degree from UT, but I, I was working hourly at the World's for a lot of things having to do the World's Fair, including in crowd control for uh, for four months, and uh, then later ended up at the uh, as a host at the Egyptian Pavilion of all things. Long story, but I'll, also uh, I worked uh, as a reporter in the '90s and later uh, about the World's Fair park redevelopment. So I got to see it from that from that angle as well. And lately, I've been looking into it as a as a historian, and looking and uh, and, and looking at it with kind of new eyes. And some in some cases, when I find uh, I found uh, resources I didn't know about before, and, and learned things about this World's Fair that I thought I knew, and, and maybe didn't know as well as I thought. Um, but. Uh, the World's Fair has been a subject of derision uh, here and elsewhere. Uh, uh, of course, we remember the notorious Simpsons episode uh, from uh, back in '98, I think it was. Um, and our recent research has uh, uh, convinced me that uh, reporters uh, from all over the country came here mainly to make fun of it. Uh, and uh, not only Andy Rooney, but a lot of people who weren't as kind as kind as he is. Uh, uh, Kurt Anderson, uh, who was one of the funniest writers in America, was one of the one of the worst that came here and wrote. Uh, really didn't find much uh, of of any of, of anything to admire about the fair, but he found a lot to make fun of. Uh, uh, Rex Reed was here, and I might mention him in a little bit. Um, A.J. Kahn from The New Yorker uh, was here. Uh, and, uh, and the, of course, the big magazines you'd expect to make fun of us, both the traditionally snarky magazines to make fun of the fair, and, and of course, the, famously, the, 
the uh, scruffy little city remark uh, in the Wall Street Journal um, is the most famous, but not the cruelest. Um, there, there are a lot worse, even cities in our region. I think Lexington was one of the worst. Lexington newspaper in Kentucky uh, said Knoxville, that sleepy little slowdown place on the road to Florida. Uh, can, can, they, can they host a World's Fair? That, that, to me, that's worse than scruffy. Uh, Nashville, a Tennessean said, uh, how can Knoxville do this? No one outside of Tennessee has ever heard of Knoxville. Um, so this, these are the people in our in our region who are saying things that are even even uh, ruder than the, the than the, the than the Yankees did. But uh, uh, the, uh, I'm interested. I have to just mention an aside. I've done some research uh, about this World's Fairs and and about Knoxville's connections to lots of other World's Fairs and other expositions in Knoxville's past. Uh, and I've wondered why they didn't use the example of the, uh, in promoting the fair, the example of the National Conservation Exposition of 1913, which was a very big deal. And believe it or not, in terms of the number, number of people who attended that fair in 1913, uh, it was bigger than some world's fairs. Uh, it, was a, it was an enormous thing. And I, I tried to find some negative press about it. Uh, and I, I've, through newspapers.com and other resources, I can look across the nation and find things about the National Conservation Exposition. And nobody said anything bad about it or made fun of Knoxville. They said that in New York and elsewhere, they said, this is an important exposition. You ought to go. And Knoxville's an interesting place to have it. Um, and that, that was what they said back in 1913. Something happened in the 69 years between 1913 and 1982 that we kind of uh, uh, lost something uh, that we used to have. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I, uh, I have to admit that in making fun of the fair, I, I joined in the fun as a, as a reporter for Metropoles back in the 90s. We did a retrospective, I did a retrospective about the World's Fair in 1997, a 15-year anniversary of the fair. And I, I made fun of a lot of it. I made fun of a lot of the fair's alleged uh, innovations uh, about uh, unrefrigerated milk, uh, about how much these have had an impact on our life. The Kodak disc camera, which was unveiled to much uh, fanfare at the fair, lasted maybe three years or so until people found out it took really crummy pictures. Um, but uh, but and, and, and then I made fun of something called touchscreen computers in, 19, in 1997. Now, I said, these are the kind of things they had at the World's Fair, these things that didn't really catch on. Well, of course, as you know, uh, back in 1997, by the way, a lot of people said it was a funny article and thanked me for it. But one one uh, reader said, "Well, I'm not sure you've assessed touchscreen computers yet. I, I think we they still have something to say to us." And of course, we all have one in our pocket today. Uh, but uh, this was in 1997. Uh, I, I, I and, and back in 97, also I regretted that we missed uh, the World's Fair missed uh, the big what I thought was the biggest innovation of of 82. And that was the brand new CD player. That was a new that was a new innovation. I thought, why didn't the World's Fair get on this, and, and why couldn't they have been the ones to introduce it? Uh, but looking back, uh, and uh, and today, touchscreen graphics, uh, touchscreen computers is much more relevant to 2022 than CD players are. If you look at, it, if you think about it. So it's a case study in how assessments of the past are constantly changing. So a history of, of one era may not be the same history that you write uh, 25 years later. Uh, and in fact, it probably won't be. Um, but uh, one of the few who mentioned, by the way, the touchscreen uh, uh, computer technology, the Elo Graphics demonstration was uh, the uh, Rex Reed, the famous uh, celebrity uh, 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 film critic that many of you remember being on TV a lot. Uh, uh, he was all over the place for a while back in the 70s. Uh, but, uh, but he was, uh, he seemed kind of perplexed by it, but at least he mentioned it. None of, uh, uh, Kurt Anderson, all these people did, these really smart New York uh, writers came here and didn't mention the touch screen, screen thing at the, at the U.S. Pavilion. People didn't notice it or didn't understand it enough to know what they were seeing. Um, but uh, but these, uh, they, I looked around at other things that are introduced or promoted kind of futuristic things at the fair, and I had to look hard because these weren't often mentioned in articles uh, uh, about the fair. Uh, and uh, th this is uh, kind of interesting, but I, I, was, I was surprised to find some rare references to, to demonstrations of, uh, of something called video conferencing. Uh, video conferencing is something I, that I never did myself until 20, the COVID uh, crisis in 2020. Uh, so, but, but in this fair, they were saying in the future, this is what it looks like, this is how it's going to work. Uh, this was at the uh, South Central Bell exhibit, I think. 
Uh, also, uh, they were they were showing how uh, we might, in the future we might uh, we might uh, shop electronically. We might get on a computer and buy things electronically, and that seemed just wacky in 1982. Uh, and, uh, and 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 even bank electronically. That just sounds you know, really scary almost. Right. But uh, but they but they were saying in the future this is what what's going to happen. Um, but and these things were relevant to the energy uh, energy theme of the fair because of course you're saving car trips every time you you, you bank or shop. Uh, electronically, um, but uh, but also in 1982 World's Fair, and I had to again look hard to find this. They had uh, several electric cars on display there. They were not they were not featured as one of the famous things of the fair, but one a corporate exhibit had uh, had at least three electron electric cars. Uh, but they weren't funny, so they got very little attention. Uh, they were they were just and, and of course it's hard to make a, an electric an, an electric car seem funny or sexy or whatever. It's just a car sitting there and it's, has to be electric. Uh, but it but anyway, obviously this is uh, this was also something relevant that we we should have paid more attention to than perhaps than than we did. Um, in uh, in 1997, in that. Uh, in that story I wrote, uh, I, I remarked, well, the, and all these, these little things were kind of funny, but the, the main gist of, the, of my article was that, uh, that the 1982 fair, uh, its main purpose was to get us away from fossil fuels and get us into more sustainable uh, energy uh, sources. And I, and I said, well, our per capita consumption of, not, of fossil fuels in America in 1997 is even higher than it was in 1982. So this was, to me, uh, prima facie evidence that uh, that the fair meant nothing; that it, 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 its main purpose was a failure. Uh, but looking back, and from this vantage in 2022, uh, 25 years later, we are using less uh, fossil fuels per capita, uh, coal and petroleum uh, in particular, than we were in 1982. I, I can't say the world's fair was was the main reason for that, but. But a lot of the reasons that we are using fewer fossil fuels were, were, uh, were, were technologies that were demonstrated at the 1982 World's Fair, uh, including nuclear power, which has is, been is uh, much more used than it was before and was a major uh, subject of discussion at the, uh, at the World's Fair. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but, uh, but, but much of the 21st century as we know it, what, much of what makes the 21st century different from the 20th, 20th century as we know it, was at least sampled at the World's Fair if you knew to look for it, if you were, if you had the patience to, to look in all the, the, the corporate exhibits and, and get away from the noise and, uh, and, and other things that, uh, that kind of the famous, the things that fair was famous for in 82. Um, politically, uh, it, it, the World's Fair is very interesting to look at because it was a World's Fair. It had, uh, it had 22 nations involved. Uh, and it was a, a snapshot of the world at a turning point. Uh, uh, whether it had an effect on the world or not, I think is uh, something that you can actually debate. But, but if you look at 1982, of course, the Cold War was still on, uh, and that was evidenced by the fact that the Soviet Union, which had pledged to be part of the fair, had withdrawn from the fair by, by uh, 1980. Uh, uh, mainly because of the their, after their invasion of Afghanistan, uh, the United States pulled out of the Moscow Olympics, and in retaliation, uh, uh, the, the USSR pulled out of the Nostal World's Fair, and also the uh, uh, Los Angeles Olympics. But uh, but uh, also you see the evidence that we had. Uh, some people, kids, might see pictures of the fair and say, "Gosh, there's a West Germany. What's that?" And uh, and there was West. It was West Germany was there, and East Germany was not. Uh, and uh, they were, of course, night and day in, in different countries in those days. But the Iron Curtain was corroding, and we saw uh, evidence of that all over the 1982 World's Fair. Uh, Hungary was there, and uh, one of the most popular uh, European exhibits, uh, because they had their Rubik's Cube. Uh, it was not uh, introduced as the World's Fair, as some people claim it was. It was actually invented in the 70s and introduced to the West in 80 and I think became a national craze in 81. People knew by 82 what a Rubik's Cube was, but it was still very new. A lot of people had never had never tried them before. Uh, and, and it was, the Rubik's Cube was arguably uh, uh, the, the first capitalist triumph by, by a communist country, if you, if you wrap your head around that. But that was, that was a big deal, I think, for Hungary to, uh, a communist country to have created something that, that caught on in such a big, big way in the West. It sold hundreds of millions of those in, in the West. 
And the guy that invented it back in the 80s, Erno Rubik, uh, was at the World's Fair in person. It was a very humble presence. I saw him several times just sitting on, on a curb uh, talking to kids and, and showing them how to do the Rubik's Cube. Uh, he, but he was uh, he, interacting with real people. It was, uh, it was, that was uh, something that I think we, we, we should remember more than the giant Rubik's Cube, which really wasn't a Rubik's Cube. But the fact that Erno Rubik himself was there, I think that's something to, worth remembering. Um, uh, uh, Poland didn't have a, uh, it was a communist country, didn't have a, a pavilion at the fair, but they sent the Warsaw Philharmonic. And this led to a very uh, uh, a, uh, uh, dramatic and emotional moment of the, of the fair uh, when the Warsaw Philharmonic uh, played at the Tennessee Amphitheater. And there was a, uh, this is during the Solidarity uh, era, and the, they had a Solidarity de dem demonstration in the audience by Polish people in the audience. And the uh, the orchestra responded uh, with with uh, tapping their their bows in in in, uh, in kind of a, kind of a quiet sort of ascent to the uh, the demonstration. But they had a big Solidarność banner. I remember being being uh, waved up there. But also uh, Czechoslovakia didn't have a pavilion. But the Prague uh, the Prague Symphony was at the World's Fair. Uh, so these uh, these there were lots of uh, these these breaks these uh, these these. Uh, 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 breaks in the Iron Curtain that were, were showing up in Knoxville in those days. Uh, another, uh, the most puzzling p international pavilion of all uh, in 1982 was the European Economic Community Pavilion. And people would go in there and they would look puzzled going in and they would look puzzled coming out. It was, it, they, they were, they, if, if they could find somebody to talk to them, they were saying, well, here in this community of, I think, only six nations at the time, they say, we're, in the future, we're going to have the same currency, and we're going to get rid of our national currencies and start using the same currency. And uh, this, uh, this sounded just bizarre, as bizarre as, as shopping online or something uh, did in 1982, and, and people weren't sure what to make of it. Of course, this was the first time what became known as the European Union ever had a pavilion at a World's Fair. Uh, and this was, uh, so that was, in retrospect, is something that we just thought was a weird dud of a pavilion at the time. This is one of the most historic pavilions at the fair. That this was that we should have paid more attention and and, uh, and said, gosh, maybe this is something we should know about. Uh, there was one country that was there that uh, was perfectly happy with fossil fuels and uh, and they actually celebrated them. Uh, they the, it was a Saudi Arabia pavilion, and if you go in there, they they just said, you want oil? We got oil. We're going to give you all the oil you want, and uh, <laughs> it, 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 as long as you don't help Israel too much. Uh, but uh, but what, they had a giant picture of King Fahd in there, and they, they were also kind of hailing their their king in, in that pavilion. It was very it was it was different from all the others. Uh, uh, Egypt uh, was the only where I worked was the only African country, uh, although there was a lengthy and earnest effort to bring in sub-Saharan nations into the World's Fair. Uh, unfortunately, they never found a corporate sponsor uh, for for that or for a, an African American pavilion that they were hoping to to establish. But they did have a, an exhibit that was sufficiently impressive that Black Enterprise Magazine uh, claimed it was the best, uh, the, the biggest and best African American exhibit in an American World's Fair. And by saying an American World's Fair is important because Paris in 1900 had a big African American exhibit uh, that was that, that actually Knox civilians participated in and, and made, made by by sending pictures of African American achievement in in Tennessee. Um, but uh, but that was uh, that was that that was I remember walking through there. I remember it vaguely, uh, but I, I I wish I paid more attention because it sounds like it was uh, was a, a pretty special thing. I, I bet New Orleans may have may have done something similar two years later. Um, the uh, the Philippines had a pavilion, uh, and of course uh, uh, it, it was a, an interesting pavilion, kind of a, a more fun pavilion than, than some. It was uh, they had a restaurant right over the uh, second creek there, and I thought this is so wonderful. I'm sure by this time next year we'll have a permanent restaurant in the same place because having a nice porch over a creek was uh, something we never had in Nosland. Actually, four years later, we still never have had that. But, uh, but uh, uh, this was one. Uh, the 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 first out of state of to uh, to visit the World's Fair was Ronald Reagan. Uh, but the uh, the the second uh, and arguably third were Ferdinand and Emilda Marcos uh, of the Philippines, uh, who got in a lot of trouble later. But they had a lot of fun at the World's Fair, especially Emilda, who was here more than once. She came she came back by herself. And spent several days in Knoxville, uh, uh, and uh, was uh, uh, a. Uh, it sounds like a, I would like to know more about this complicated, uh, complicated lady who was here, and I think I think she's still alive. But um, but uh, uh, China, of course, uh, as we mentioned, was, and this was a big deal. Uh, the, the first ever pavilion 
uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, mainland China at at a uh, uh, at a World's Fair since 1904 and the first ever of of the People's Republic of China in any World's Fair. Uh, so that was uh, that was China at the very beginning of China's uh, global, arguably dominance of, of, of the world economy. In the 1970s, China had still been kind of the, the secret country that didn't really uh, uh, interact with the world very much. But by 1982, suddenly here was China, and, and I think they wanted to say, "Here we are." Uh, get used to us because China became obviously a major, major figure. I'm not sure we would have Walmart today if not for the People's Republic of China and, and their, their kind of crossing boundaries that they, that they uh, had not crossed before uh, you know, at the time of the World's Fair. I and mean, this is one of the few cases of, of something that was the most popular thing at the fair, uh, or, or in, in retrospect, often the, the most popular things are often the most, not the most uh, important historically. But this was the case. The China was the, the single biggest sensation of the 1982 World's Fair, and in retrospect, the fact that they were there, uh, uh, especially since the Soviet Union had not come, uh, was, uh, was, was, was probably the, the single most significant thing about the World's Fair, uh, getting uh, the West used to the idea that China is now joining us uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the modern world. Uh, Japan, of course, we saw a bit about Japan, uh, and even they have uh, an interesting uh, context to their exhibit. They had a famous for their painting robot, and uh, people like to talk about the painting robot. It's really a painting robot, and uh, there was a the the, the subtext to this was that uh, Japan's robotic domination of uh, of, uh, or, or, uh, of the autom automobile man manufacturing business. Uh, this is about the time that Japan was overtaking. The United States in, in automobile manufacturing, and uh, but they didn't want to show off that. That was but that would, would have been rude. They want to show the really smart robots that can paint, not not build cars. Painting is not threatening, but they wanted to kind of subtly show us what, you know what they can do with their with their with their robotic robotic technology. Uh, so a lot of the uh, exhibits, uh, the UK had a had a had a had a, had a pavilion. Uh, they, were, at the time, were enmeshed in the Falklands War, uh, which uh, people talked about during the fair. I don't think it was a, a major uh, issue, except for the fact that Peru was on the opposite side, and I, the UK pavilion was over here, and Peru was very far away. They were supporting different sides in, in the war. Um, but uh, but they, uh, the UK may be remembered for closing uh, for one day. I think it's the only pavilion that closed for a day in, on uh, June 21st. Uh, can I guess what they closed for? Uh, uh, Princess Diana had a baby and it named him Prince William. Uh, Prince William was born uh, on June 21st and the UK pavilion closed to have a party uh, to celebrate the new baby. So we know who's turning 40 uh, next, next month. Um, but uh, uh, I might mention the uh, uh, symposia, and this is one of the interesting uh, parts of the fair that I, I, do, I think is, is under, understudied. Uh, there were several symposia, at least four that I know of, and these were energy uh, uh, big meetings with 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 uh, scientists and politicians and people like this coming together to talk about uh, energy challenges. Um, I think we need to sponsor maybe a major research project in time for the 50th anniversary of the fair to see what uh, was actually accomplished uh, at, at these uh, at these uh, at these big big meetings. But there were. There were, uh, uh, say, uh, four of them, uh, uh, including uh, among the people who spoke and presented papers at these at these uh, things were Armand Hammer, uh, the industrialist, uh, Al Gore Sr., uh, George Bundy, a major figure in, in, uh, in foreign uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, Alvin Weinberg, the famous uh, Oak Ridge uh, scientist, uh, uh, Imelda Marcos, believe it or not, presented a paper, a long, seemingly thoughtful and well-researched paper on nuclear energy. At one of these uh, things, uh, she she traveled a lot and she talked about different nuclear plants she'd seen in Nigeria and India and other other parts of the world and uh, and was just and, and they were talking about solving all these individual specific problems in different parts of the world and to, to go to all those places and find out what <coughs> happened and and as a result of this is would be it would take some time to do. Uh, uh, Sigvard Eklund, who was one of the leading. Uh, 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 I think he was leader of the, the, in, from Sweden, leader of international uh, nuclear regulatory uh, organization. Um, uh, dozens and dozens of others. Also, Energy Secretary James Edwards, who may be the only 
uh, cabinet secretary who was in favor of abolishing his own cabinet. Uh, he was uh, Reagan's uh, secretary, and he actually said, I don't think I should, ha I should have this role. I don't think my, this cabinet should exist. And, uh, and he said the answer to everything is the free market. And, and, uh, but uh, at one of these, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, S. David Freeman uh, of TVA uh, came here, and I would love to find out more of what he said. Uh, this is one of the ones, I've read a lot of these papers. They're actually published uh, in, in three volumes that are up at McClung Collection upstairs. Um, but the, the one, one is not published, and it's one looking at the environmental impact of energy choices. And as David Freeman says, we're looking at a, uh, at, at a, a uh, if we don't get a handle on this, a, a, a major uh, uh, apocalyptic havoc era in the future if we don't get a handle on our, our, our the, the environmental research, the, the results of, of, uh, of, of energy uh, use. Uh, so I, I would really be really interested to see what he said. I, it sounds like he was talking about uh, what we now know as, as climate change. Um, but uh, anyway, they were examining very specific issues about uh, things in Brazil and, and the, in the Far East, all, all over the place. Got very little press attention, just a couple of articles I found, these, uh, these symposia. Uh, but, uh, but they are, uh, are these three volumes of books about the first three uh, symposia, are, I'm told, are in 200 different libraries around the world today. And, and, and uh, they, they, they're there to be seen. Whether anybody ever cracks the, their spines, I don't, I don't know. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, Eric mentioned the Folk Life Festival, which uh, is, if I had to go back to the ferry, that's the one thing I would do a lot more of, because there, there were people, uh, a lot of them were older people, but there were people who performed there, like R.L. Burnside and, and Howard Armstrong, who have become legends after, since then. You know, they performed there, and they're just kind of interesting old guys at the fair, but they've, you know, they've since become the subjects of documentaries and, and kind of revivals and, and have, have, have made more albums and, and afterwards. Uh, what we still have at the fair is, is some interesting architecture, uh, some of it controversial. Um, the, you know, the Sun Sphere uh, has become uh, kind of part of the, the uh, skyline of Knoxville. And uh, uh, the, uh, d discussing the, the, the idea of 1933 and, and what it has to do with the World's Fair, there are actually other, other things that have to do with 1933 and why you might date that as the beginning of the World's Fair because uh, Hubert Bebb, who designed the Sun Sphere, had been a designer at the Chicago World's Fair of 1933. Uh, so that, and, and actually, there are several other connections, including those guys on the radio, that radio reunion. Those, those were guys who used to play with the Midday Merry-Go-Round. The Midday Merry-Go-Round was created by a guy from Chicago named uh, Lowell Blanchard, uh, who was a radio announcer. Uh, but he began his career as an announcer where? At the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. So they, they, it, all, these, all these things uh, uh, connect in, in kind of surprising ways. Um, but uh, but uh, maybe more interesting uh, to, archi to architects, at least, is the, uh, the, the building at the foot of the Sun Sphere, uh, which is the Tennessee Amphitheater. And it was designed by a guy then not very well known, a German uh, architectural engineer named Horst Berger. Uh, that uh, Bruce McCarty here in Knoxville worked with, and uh, and he designed this 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 really unusual thing called using tensile fabric. And I was interested to see uh, uh, Andy Rooney, I think, saying we see all these futuristic buildings that we'll, we'll never see in the future. Well, this is an exception. Uh, Tennessee Amphitheater has that this style. They called it Dolly's Bra in 1982, <laughs> but they uh, that style has been used around the world and in major in major buildings uh, since then, including the Denver International Airport, uh, SeaWorld in California, uh, a, a big sports stadium in Saudi Arabia. Uh, used this, these things that they look, they look like great big versions of the Tennessee Amphitheater, and it's this unusual kind of a kind of a, a style of, of 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 architecture that has caught on in, in some very uh, uh, conspicuous places. Um, but uh, this, uh, the fair may be most historic as the most preservationist World's Fair in history. Uh, no other World's Fair I know of has saved uh, so many existing buildings and used them in the fair and then keep, kept them afterwards. Uh, that's uh, something that, they, that was done very deliberately at this site, which had several historic buildings. The LN station, which had been empty for 14 years, suddenly was uh, was a you know a restaurant and office complex during the fair. 
uh, the, uh, the, the old, uh, it looks like it should have been torn down uh, at, at one point in some of the old pictures, but the uh, foundry, you know, of course, became the straw house, which became uh, the, the, you know, the, is now used as the foundry in a very useful event space. We're having our fundraiser next, next month uh, there, as we have many times in the past. It's a great building, it's 19, 19, 19, 1870 circa building, um, industrial building that's, uh, this, that's popular every day. Um, but uh, also the candy factory, of course, and, uh, and all the uh, Victorian houses, these wooden houses, they were almost torn down in the late 1970s, are still were rehabbed for the fair and were, were put together and, and, and kept together and, and, and used during the fair as different kind of exhibit sites. One of them was the uh, Budweiser uh, Beer Garden Pavilion because it was kind of overlooking the, uh, the Clydesdale stables. Um, but, uh, but one of them was a, a, an energy uh, uh, saving building uh, during the World's Fair to show how uh, even an, an old Victorian house could save energy. And uh, this was done, redone by Knox Heritage and, and others about a few years ago to be an, a, a LEED certified energy saving building, the same house. And it's now, I think, just a, a residence. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, uh, anyway, the, these things, uh, I love the, the fact that these things resonate, but all seven of those Victorian houses are still there. We saved all but one of the buildings we saved for the World's Fair, the old uh, Ellen and Hotel uh, actually burned. Uh, it wasn't uh, that that wasn't much of a building to begin with, but it was uh, it was uh, it was an interesting old place. Um, but uh, but we do have a, a really great park, uh, a, a unique park, a, a park unlike any place in the world. I think with this interesting variety of old buildings and uh, and uh, kind of startling new buildings on the same place, and lots of new things like the, the National Museum of Art and the uh, Veterans Memorial. Uh, these these interesting things to look at. It's it's one of the most interesting walks around. Of course, the Rachmaninoff statue, which uh, I think the, Russia finally came to the World's Fair when they put up the Rachmaninoff statue. Um, but uh, but anyway, our, our, uh, uh, comparing notes 25 years after my first slightly jaundiced assessment of the World's Fair, um, it's, uh, I'm realizing it's hard to come to conclusions after only 40 years. I think we may, may have another assessment in, in, uh, in 10 years at the 50th anniversary and think something entirely different about the World's Fair that we're not thinking about today. Uh, but we uh, uh, are, 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 are happy to have got to work with uh, Humanities Tennessee and, and UT and uh, East Tennessee Historical Society to put out this, uh, this little book. It's, it's really just like a, a long article uh, in book form, but I hope you, uh, hope you get a chance to, to, to read that uh, and let me know what you think. Um, but uh, we are, uh, uh, we're, we're grateful to have been part of this. Uh, I, uh, it, it's a, it's a not the final, and again, it's not the final word, I bet I, I might, if I'm still around in 10 years, I might write a whole completely different book about the World's Fair because the World's Fair was a thousand things and it, it just kind of, it's all like, like a lot of moving parts. Uh, that, that's what history is. They really are trying to capture a glimpse of history at, from different vantages, but they're always changing. But thanks uh, thanks to my colleague, my name's on it, but my colleague uh, Paul James had about as much to do as, with it as I did and, and Nicole Stahl, our, our, our where the assistant has, has done a lot of work to do to, to, to make it happen to, as well. Uh, but anyway, uh, go over visit our, our corner over here at Center for we have a weekly newsletter. And uh, we're also, uh, I want to should, should also mention that two weeks from Saturday, there's going to be a big, probably, uh, probably not a scholarly uh, celebration of, uh, of the World's Fair uh, sponsored by Visit Knoxville on the, on the World's Fair Park. Uh, so that'll be Saturday, May 21st, and we're going to be part of that as well, giving tours and talks and that sort of thing. But uh, anyway, I'd be happy to take any questions if, if there are any. Um, we, I've, I've really gotten fascinated with looking into uh, different aspects of the fair I hadn't thought about before. We did, we've done a couple of programs about the architecture of the fair, uh, but also the, the whole Knoxville's deep history in connections to World's Fairs. We had a mayor who was once a U.S. commissioner to the Paris World's Fair of 1878, uh, for example. Um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, any, any any questions or comments? Yeah. Is there um, a publicly accessible uh, documentation of this lead Victorian house, uh, like a little YouTube video or something that shows people here's what you, you know? It just so happens that uh, that Kim Trent is in the room and she could tell you everything uh, everything she knows about. I think she led part of the part of that uh, that project uh, back. It was probably what well, five or six years ago, right? <laughs> but it, I think if you look on yeah, YouTube, um, it's the Knox Heritage Greenhouse, and there's a whole video about how we pulled the project together in cooperation with ORNL and the city, and 
I'm pretty sure it's still up on YouTube, and it's a Knox Heritage Greenhouse, and it's LEED Platinum Certified for Residential Property. Yeah, and a great place for it, the Energy World Spirit site. Yeah. I think questions? you indicated that uh, the Washington Post was the original, uh, was where the origin started with the scrubby little city. No, no that, that was actually the uh, Wall Street Journal. Oh, the Wall Street yeah, Journal. Yeah. But Sam Donaldson, I think, was credited with kind of promoting that one. The, the, the journalist, I'd heard that he was was also a he might be there, 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 there are a whole lot of culprits out there <laughs> I mean, this we, we were just it was open season on Knoxville for about two two and a half years there when when just uh, and, and it went, like I say it wasn't just these area uh, Yankees it was our, our friends and neighbors uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the region who were uh, who were making fun of us but I think we've kind of got I don't think people would would say these things today I think, I that, think we've got so. messed up yeah. but uh, all right other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, hello. Um, so I have taken a Tennessee history class, and who knows, you probably already went over it because I came a little later. Mm -hmm. um, but Petro's, the, the restaurant, yeah. like, what did it start from? Yeah, 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 yeah. Petro's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a regional chain. I think there are maybe 25 or 30 uh, places. I, and one just down the street, I, I had uh, actually, it's a quick place for, I had a Petro early this week in fact, for lunch. Um, but yeah, they, they, that was, they wanted something emblematic. Uh, they were, there are all these stories about how the ice cream cone and things like this were launched at World's Fairs. And I think they were, they, World's Fair was encouraging people to think of different kinds of things and the idea of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, it, of some people put, corn chips on top of their chili, they said, why don't we put chili on the corn chips instead, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's something altogether different. But, uh, something that I've learned that the reason why it's called Petros is because the theme was about energy. Mm -hmm. You should, like, they should give you, like, this meal should give you energy, so it's petroleum, but yeah. Petros. Yeah, that, that, that's right, yeah, 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 you're right, yeah. I recall that there was a big electric substation right in the middle of it, and they tried really hard to get to move. And You're right, did not. and it's funny we, we successfully did move it uh, uh, what, about 20 years ago yeah. for the, the convention center, which was apparently a bigger deal than the World's Fair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but but I think they they, they very cleverly uh, uh, turned it into an educational thing by by painting it contrasting colors, and and if you went up to it, you would see that this is the. The whatever the the, the fragile stat, and this is the whatever you can you can uh, you can you can figure out how an electric substation, which is certainly relevant to the energy theme, and how it works. But, uh, yeah. Sorry, one last thing. Like uh, I learned that um, it would be sorry. It was the idea was not originally going to be green. It was for to be blue, and then they had painted it blue, and then they decided that. They the, the substation or the oh sorry I thought you just said sunscreen oh sunscreen okay yeah, yeah no I, I didn't I never heard that you know, those they're trying to look at the uh, make it look like the sun from the beginning but yeah yeah uh, okay yeah yeah okay. the videos that were shown at the Tennessee Theater Sunday do you know if those are available somewhere to watch that's a question for Eric who's I guess is still there yeah the, the videos there were there were that they uh, are the videos that the, that you showed at the Tennessee on Sunday, are they available to see? Um, so East Tennessee Public Television is going to be uploading, they're in the process of uploading 200 hours worth of videos. And the great thing about that is that it's, uh, it's, it's folk life stuff, so much of what they did. They were there every day recording stuff. The stuff at Tamas, uh, we don't quite have the infrastructure or staff to sort of facilitate that. But if you go to our Vimeo channel, uh, B-I-M-E-O. It's like YouTube, but better quality and without all the comments and weird stuff. Uh, there's quite a few World's Fair video. Okay. So, uh, a few dozen. So, uh, is PBS going to have that on, online somewhere? Yeah, they have a YouTube channel, and I'm sure oh. once everything's uploaded, they'll, they'll do a, a bigger, you know, sort of public announcement. And blast of that. Okay. So, Tamas, Vimeo, B-I-M-E-O, and then uh, East Tennessee PBS YouTube channel. Okay, thanks. All right, well, thanks a lot, folks. And, 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 uh, and I, 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 I tend to intend to spend the next 10 years learning more and more about the World's Fair because it's really just uh, an enormous subject. Yeah. That, thanks, Randy. Thanks, Dan. We're going to just finish quickly with a, a couple of quick spots about the podcasts uh, just to let you know about some of the episodes we're going to be diving in. Uh, 
briefly start with uh, Dr. Chad Black, who's our Latin American story and has an interesting story to tell. Uh, as Uri said, I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Chad Black. I'm a Latin American historian. And the story that my episode that I've produced of this podcast is going to tell is the story of the unveiling of the uh, mummy bundle from Peru, which turned out to be a very controversial moment in the history of the fair. And it's a really fascinating moment, not just because of the controversy that occurred at, you know, on July 28th, a day chosen, because it is the uh, National Independence Day of Peru, but also because of the way that the differing um, politics around indigenous identity and, and indigenous political power in Peru versus the United States worked out in this crazy moment. Like many stories of the fair, it involves people with uh, interesting backgrounds and personalities. The butchers found a entrepreneur, a young Peruvian entrepreneur living in Miami named Jorge Bosa, and quite late um, recruited him to set up this Peruvian pavilion, which he did because his family had all kinds of great connections. Um, this included the idea of the unveiling of the sort of spectacle unveiling of a mummy bundle from that was found uh, on the coastal region near the Peruvian capital of Lima. Um, as word of, of this got out, the mummy arrived with an estimated like forty million dollars worth of gold, uh, you know. Um, objects, art objects, much of them from the Inca period, Native American activists in the United States started to protest. There's a guy with uh, his own little interesting background named William Rattlesnake Jackson, who represented a group called the Southeastern Cherokee Confederacy, LLC, who wrote to Senator Sam Nunn saying that he heard that an Aztec mummy was going to be unveiled at the, at the fair and that this would be, um, you know, sacrilegious. Of course, the Aztecs are from Mexico, so there was a little bit of misunderstanding going on. There's um, the leader of the National uh, Congress of American Indians, a guy named Ron Andrade, who um, led protests closer to the time of the actual unveiling and um, suggested that the people who participated should be concerned that they were going to be cursed with the uh, infection of valley fever. Um, there were uh, people from the anthropology department uh, at the University of Tennessee who were recruited to participate in the event as well, including uh, Dr. Bill Bast, the um, now famous founder of The Body Farm. And there is video of this unveiling, and it's, it's, it's quite striking and in some ways disturbing. These long silences of an invited crowd of roughly 400, 450 people at the uh, amphitheater. You can occasionally hear in the background people yelling and protest um, outside of the event. And they slowly begin to take apart this bundle where they're uh, um, they find a number of items that the individual had been buried with, the individual who turned out to be a very young child, two, two and a half years old, something like that. Um, <clears throat> this was not the first time a, a mummy bundle had been um, brought to the United States and, op and opened, but it was the last. And in fact, there was only one other export of, um, of mummified remains from Peru after the fair in 1996, I believe it was. Um, a woman's body was found, um, or mummy, mummified bundle was found at the top of a, um, a, a mountain in Peru. She was nicknamed Juanita, and the politics of indigenous representation in Peru changed from 1982 to 1996, in part because of the experience of the Knoxville World's Fair. And um, uh, indigenous groups inside of Peru demanded that Juanita's body and remains be returned to uh, Peru and put under 
you know, the authority of indigenous groups there. So there's a whole lot more to this story, I promise. That's a very short, short version of it. So please do turn in when um, these episodes start to drop. Um, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, and I'm sure it's going to be linked as well on WUOT. Who's next? And here comes Shelly. Thank you. I am Shelley Wu, and I am the historian of modern China at UT. So I'll keep it very brief because we are doing a podcast episode on China at the Knoxville World's Fair, including this event that I hosted in 2018, where I invited Bo Roberts, which you saw in the video. He was the CEO and president of the Knoxville International Energy Expo, Incorporated. And as, uh, as the CEO, he headed to China several times to negotiate and to invite them to come and host the pavilion. And also KIEE actually eventually uh, supported the China pavilion with a million dollars payment, which Bo said was the best money they ever spent because that turned out to be the main attraction. So for tonight, I just wanted to show you some of these images. So in conjunction with that in event and also with an interview that I did with Bo, um, we also had a graduate student go through the McClung collection, through these boxes, to look at these documents, many of them just box and have never been well organized. So um, I want to show you some of these documents that we found in the archives. So of course, it, the, the uh, 2022 is not only the 40th anniversary of the World's Fair, but also the 50th anniversary of Nixon's historic visit to China, which opened the way to China's opening and rejoining the world community and then participating in the World's Fair. As a result, you see the dramatic economic change that occurred in a span of several decades. The, t the one image on the right is of Shenzhen. So in the beginning of uh, the 1980s, when it was, a it was designated a special economic zone, and it was basically nothing. And um, the lower image is the same, Shenzhen, now a major world city. So what is really incredible about China's participation is also the way that the World's Fair and corp the corporation basically acted as a diplomatic body. They had to visit all of these countries, negotiate agreements with them, and um, to also invite these, uh, to invite the support of President Carter and also our Tennessee representatives, senators, and congressmen, and to invite these um, um, so these are the kind of exchanges, the letter from Jimmy Carter to Jake Butcher uh, from 81. And also these, the letter to the Chinese ambassador to the U.S., uh, Chai Zhulimi. So this is a story that actually, I don't know if it will make it into the podcast, but Bo had this great story because when he visited China several times, each time he, uh, the Chinese hosted him, they gave him banquets, and with Chinese banquets, it often involves a great deal of alcohol, this baijiu that is served. So when the Chinese ambassador came to Knoxville to sign the final agreement, they went up to Gatlinburg and Bo was like, okay, now you're gonna have moonshine. So they got him really drunk with moonshine. <laughs> and on the bus ride back to Knoxville, apparently the ambassador was in a great mood, started to compose a song on Sino-US uh, friendship. Um, so if we're now at a low point of U.S.-China relations, uh, this whole moonshine song, moonshine field song to U.S.-China friendship was the, one of the high points at the time. <laughs> This is the design for the China Pavilion, which in the, they completely ignored the theme of energy, and basically it turned out to be, uh, they sh showcased some major aspects of Chinese artifacts, some of which have never uh, since actually is, are now very rare to leave the country. Um, 
This is again mock-ups of the, the design of the pavilion. Uh, there were various miscommunications at the time. The, they consulted UT architecture about building a tower. It turned out when they actually went to China that that was actually a Japanese tower, but not a Chinese style. <laughs> Uh, the interior, and also uh, in order to learn more about, because at the time, the People's Republic had never participated in a World's Fair, so they sent a delegation, they went around with a small group of uh, staff to previous sites, including Seattle and San Francisco, to learn more about the, the experience of these pavilions. And, um, this is um, the, the delegation visiting in the, U, um, the U.S. And if everyone looks very delighted, you have to keep in mind that the, at that time, the entire Chinese delegation, this would have been, except for the ambassador, this would have been the, the first time that anyone left China. Um, so it was an amazing uh, experience. Uh, this is the signing of agreement of interest with the Commissioner General, um, and, and of course this was then widely touted as a, a big get. Um, I think at the time there was considerable concern when the Soviet Union pulled out because they were going to be the anchor pavilion. And so when the Soviet Union pulled out and these Eastern European countries pulled out, there was real concern that you, know, you can't have a World's Fair without these major countries to draw interest. Um, and the coverage uh, uh, of the Times, uh, that's Bo Roberts up there with the Chinese delegation. One of the first things that I noticed when I moved to Knoxville in 2011 is I went up the, to the, uh, went up the Sun Sphere, and then I was really amazed to see, oh, you know, there, there's the people in Mao suits uh, at the World's Fair on the opening day. Um, and of this group the, of Tennessee Performing Arts in the reception for the Chinese delegation. And of course, in the pavilion itself, these are displays of these cultural um, products, uh, carved ivory, um, China's coal industry, uh, which actually fit in with the theme of energy. and. If you listened to the commercial, it seemed like they were bringing over the Great Wall. Yes, they did. They brought over 19 bricks of the Great Wall. This was a huge deal at, at the time. Um, and also, uh, just a few years earlier, they had unearthed uh, the terracotta warriors uh, from the first emperor. Uh, and they brought over a couple of the terracotta warriors. So again, this is now would be extremely rare for these artifacts to leave the, the country, to leave China now. Um, and people have mentioned these huge lines. So we have actually great images uh, from the, the collected images of the China Pavilion and also of the line. And it was billed as this major attraction. So you really want to run towards it when the first thing when the fair opened in the morning. Um, and I think one of the other things is that the sport delegation, so these are people who at, at that point had never been abroad, uh, but actually they were working really hard the whole time because uh, they were creating these artifacts in the pavilion. This was one of the big draws. And here is the Terracotta Warriors and the 19 bricks. <laughs> so the, the big, the, the Great Wall is coming to Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> Um, so some of the other coverage, um, just and that language is uh, rather unfortunate. China takes a great leap, uh, and of course the great leap forward in the late 50s that was when millions of people starved to death uh, in, these, in these efforts, so rather unfortunate language. Um, but uh, so a lot of this we'll, we're covering in our episode for the podcast, so please look for it, um, and I'm glad to share these images with you. Thank you all very much for coming. Have a good night.